just about to get in the bath when I heard the bell go. Almost jumped out of my skin. Since the murders I've been convinced the old Bill were going to be around at any time. When I opened up I saw that it was Matty, this young gypsy bloke who I'd seen around town. It was a real relief. But not for long. Someone told me you're looking to buy a shotgun, he said. I've got one in my van. This was fucking tricky. You have to remember that at the time every single newspaper, every magazine, Every TV bulletin and radio broadcast is about these three local blokes who've been brutally murdered, blasted in their car by some bloke with a shotgun. And then you have to remember that up until the day before that, I'd been asking everyone I knew, I mean everyone, to get me a gun. I was really desperate for it. But now, the gun had arrived. What I wanted to say was, no thanks mate, I don't need it anymore. But that would have been a bit of a giveaway. Okay, I said, great. I'll have a look. I went to the bloke's van and he opened up the back to show me this nine shot single barrel pump action shotgun with three cartridges, all in a brown plastic case. He wanted £350 for it, so I told him I'd have to call up a mate to check if the price was right. I slipped back indoors and phoned Mick. He agreed that the best way to avoid suspicion was to go ahead and buy it. And he promised he'd pay me back right away. As soon as Matty was out of sight, I drove straight over to Meadow Cottage. Mick wasn't around, so I took the gun and hid it in the barn behind some bamboo poles. Eventually, Mick turned up, and I told him what I'd done and followed him into the barn. What happened next, I will never forget. Mick took the gun out of the case, took out the three cartridges, and slowly pushed them one by one into the magazine of the gun. Then he started playing around with it, tossing it from one hand to another, to test its weight and balance. The gun was spinning all over the place, but every now and again, it ended up pointing directly at my head. And all the time I was standing there thinking, Fuck, how did I let myself get into such a stupid situation? Eventually, Mick unloaded the gun, put it back into his case. It was only when I got back into my van to drive home, I couldn't get the key into the ignition, that my hands were shaking so much, that I realized just how scared I'd been. I'm sitting alone on the sofa in my living room watching some crappy TV show when I hear a car pull up outside. At first I think it's my neighbours getting back from work but as I listen I realise that the footsteps on the gravel are making their way towards my front door. I sit there waiting for the sound of the bell but it never comes. Instead there's this horrible racket, this crashing, tearing sound of wood splitting and glass shattering, the kicking the door down, smashing the way in. Before I've had a chance to react, I hear them running through the house, knocking stuff over, throwing things against the wall, and screaming out my name over and over again. I want to run away, to hide, anything, but I'm frozen to the spot with fear. And the noise, and the stamping, and the screaming goes on and on, and gets louder and louder, until finally, the door to the front door bursts open, and Mick and Jack are standing there. And their faces are both covered in streaks of blood, and they have shotguns in their hands. As they see me, they start laughing harder and harder. Then they raise their guns so they level with my head, and I see their fingers tighten on the triggers. And then there's this blinding flash. And then I wake up. It was more than a month after the murders, but the nightmares were still as vivid as ever. So bad 
that I was almost afraid to go to sleep at night. For obvious reasons, I'd been doing my level best to avoid Mick and Jack. I'd stopped selling drugs, I'd been working all hours to keep myself occupied, and basically stayed away from places where I knew they might go. Mick, clever git, sent over some really expensive Christmas presents for my kids, and invited me and my wife over for lunch. Short of telling Sandra the truth, something I just couldn't do. There was no way to explain to her why I didn't want to go. She was always into being polite and proper. If someone did something nice to you, it was only right to go and thank them. I will never forget the day. The kids were running around in Mickey's garden, chasing after rabbits and having the time of their lives. Sandra was having a good old smoking and drinking session with Jackie Street. Mick was pissing about with his new toy, a radio controlled plane, and I was standing around like a prat, stone cold sober, desperate to be anywhere but there. After that, I didn't see Mick again until the new year. He'd ring me up every now and again, and then ask me to do some electrical work or some other building work at his house. And like some spineless dog, I'd always say yes. I felt pretty shit every time, but the truth is, I just didn't know what else to do. In my mind, I was as guilty of the murder as anyone else. If it ever came on top, all it would take would be for one of them to say that I knew all about it, and agree to drop them off and pick them up afterwards, and that would be it. I'd be doing life right alongside them. But the more I saw Mick after the murders, the less I believed that he would ever stitch me up like that. He wasn't the same person anymore. Whenever we were alone together, he'd start trying to justify the killings to me. He'd start off by saying how all three of them were scum and that he'd done the world a favour. Then he'd talk about the facts that even Sarah Saunders, even though she'd lost the father of her kid, was much happier now that Pat was dead. He told me that when the police had questioned Sarah, they'd asked her if she knew anyone who might want Pat dead. She said she didn't. Then they said, would well, you know anyone who might want Pat dead? Because they found out he was informing on them. Mick was also convinced that Pat was a grass, and finally through Sarah, he'd got confirmation. You see, Darren, that's another reason to have killed the... Another time, he started talking about how the police were saying they had no idea who was behind the murder. I tell you what, Darren, you could look in the phone book and just pick a name out at random, and I bet you find someone who wanted all three of them dead. No one is going to miss them at all. But it was all talk. Deep down, Mick was really bothered about what he'd done. Before the murder, when I was working at his house, I'd always suggest going out for a couple of pints at lunchtime, but he'd always refuse, saying it was better to work through and get everything done. After the murder, we'd do a couple of hours' work, and then he'd literally drag me to the nearest pub as soon as it opened, and we'd spend the rest of the day there getting pissed. And it didn't just happen once or twice, it happened every single time I saw him. Jack, on the other hand, didn't seem to have changed at all. I found that really scary. It wasn't just what Mick had said about the cold-hearted way he'd carried out the murders, though I couldn't get the image of Jack as a robotic killing machine out of my mind. There was just something about him that gave me the creeps. Although we never really admitted it, the two of us never really got on from the time we first met at Hollinsley Bay. Jack loved Mick to bits and would do absolutely anything for him, but me, he didn't seem to have any time for, and the feeling was completely mutual. We'd had a few laughs over the years, and we were always pretty nice to each other whenever we met, but the truth was, I trusted Jack exactly about as far as I could throw him. Around the middle of February, on one of those days when we should have been working, but went to the pub instead, Mick and I started talking about flying. I don't remember how it started, but we ended up having this friendly argument about how easy it was to navigate from the air. I was saying that it couldn't be that hard, because you'd be able to recognise fields and roads and buildings, Mick was saying it was really difficult and that I probably couldn't even recognise my own house from the air. I'd never been in any kind of plane in my life. So when Mick started saying, let's put it to the test, why don't you come flying with me next week? I started to get really excited and then told him I'd love to. Let's agree then, Mick said. You and me up in a plane next weekend and we'll see how well you do. I thought it was just a beer talking, but the following weekend Mick phoned me up and said we ran for my flying lesson in half an hour. I was at the door within the seconds of the bell ringing and when I tugged it open there was Mick and there was Jack standing right beside him. Ready for your flying lesson? asked Mick. I looked at the two of them again. Is Jack coming as well then? I said. Mick looked over at Jack then back at me. Don't worry he said. He can sit in the back. Silence. And then I took a deep breath. Actually I can't today after all. I forgot that I promised Sandra I'd take the kids out to the pictures. They're almost ready to leave. Uh, maybe some other time? As they walked away, I don't mind telling you 
that was absolutely shitting myself. Maybe I was just being paranoid. Maybe it would have just been fine. When I told Sandra about it, she said I was stupid, knowing how much I'd always wanted to go flying. But the fact was that Jack had turned up really scared me. Up until then, Mick and Jack had only used me because of my skill as an electrician, or to move drugs for them. Going flying would have been the first time ever that they wanted to do something with me purely for pleasure. And that just didn't feel right. I was pretty sure the only lesson I would have got was in free fall parachute jumping without the parachute. After that, my relationship with Mick started to get more and more strained. And by the beginning of the March, any change in his personality seemed to have faded away completely. I was still working for him, doing up his house and stuff, but he never had time to take me to the pub anymore. Sometimes, he'd even forget to pay me. I knew he was planning to start smuggling again, having hooked up with some bloke called Russell, and I was getting more and more tense waiting for him to call me and ask me to join in. I'd already made up my mind that I was never ever going to do it again, and now I had the perfect excuse. My one year passport had run out, but I was still worried about how he'd react. The day I told him about it, there was this long, awkward silence on the other end of the phone. Eventually, Mick just said, OK, and put the phone down. Instantly, I felt like this huge weight had been lifted off my shoulders. The work on the bungalow was finished, and I was able to go abroad, and I no longer had any real use as far as Mick was concerned. He dropped me like a stone, and I was more happy for him to let me go. I felt like this was going to be the end of it. Then, out of the blue... Something happened which completely turned my life around. Suddenly, I was desperate to spend as much time with Mick as possible. Not only that, but I also wanted to return to the drug business. I wanted Mick to sell me, or the puff he could get his hands on. The first time he spoke to me, I almost cacked my pants. I was in a sailing oak pub having a quick drink, when I thought I felt someone tap me on my shoulder. I was going to ignore it, and I heard a voice say, I know you're a drug dealer. In the instant it took me before I turned around, all kind of things were going through my head. I was wondering if the person was definitely talking to me, whether anyone else had heard. Most of all though, I was wondering who the f*** it might be. I was really, really hoping that it might be one of my old customers, or some old friend with a big mouth. Someone stupid. Someone I could just tell to piss off. And then I turned around, and I saw Detective Constable Jim standing next to me, with a big smirk on his face. There and then... I wanted the ground to open up and swallow me whole. Anywhere but there was where I wanted to be. This was really bad. Really, really bad news. I'd never spoken to Jim, but I knew who he was because I'd passed across twice before. The first time was in the same pub about a month or so before the murders when someone pointed him out as a copper who had lent his car, an XR3i, to three of his mates who were going out on a pub crawl. They'd written it off. Naturally, one of them ended up in intensive care. We were all talking about it in the pub, and I said something like, Now, not much of a detective, is he? We couldn't see that one coming, is he? Jim was standing right next to me at the time, but he never said anything. He just looked really pissed off and a bit embarrassed. The second time was outside the Sailing Oak, just after Christmas, when I saw him unloading a load of bottles of spirits in the back of his car and taking them into the pub. I remember asking someone later what he was up to, and they said that the landlord was a mate of his, and Jim had managed to sort him out some cheap booze from one of the police auctions. So there I was, in the pub with his copper, and he was looking at me straight in the eye, and accusing me of being a drug dealer. And I was desperately trying to think of something to say, when he started up again. I suppose you're going to deny it, he said. Everyone always denies it. Double fuck. He'd taken the words right out of my mouth, but I thought I might as well say it anyway. I don't know what you're talking about, I said. All that was a long time ago. You're out of date, mate. And then I walked off. Two days later, Jim phoned me up on my mobile, having got the number from my boss, who it turned out was a mate of his. I'm only telling you this because you're a friend of Dave, he said. You're about to get spun. The drug squad is planning a raid on your place because they reckon you've got a load of gear stashed away. I just laughed. I didn't think the drug squad were that slow. I've told you, mate, that's all in the past. He didn't care. I'm telling you, Darren, you're going to get spun this week, any day now. There's a note here on the office wall. I'm looking at it right now. I tell you what though, if you're telling me the truth and you've not got it anymore, well I might be able to stop it. I'll have a word with some people, see what I can do. A few days after that, Jim phoned me up again. See, I stopped it from happening. You didn't get spun after all. I think we should meet up because you owe me a beer. Even I could see right through this one. It had to be just about the oldest trick in the book. Okay, this bloke was a copper and obviously knew quite a bit about me. 
but I was pretty certain that I was never about to get spun. He just made the offering up to get me to believe I owed him, and now he wanted me to meet up so we could call in the favour. It crossed my mind that it might be some kind of ploy the police were using to try to find out about the rest of the murders, but the more I thought about it, the less likely it seemed. I'd been reading the papers and watching stuff on the TV, and it seemed pretty clear from what the police were saying that they didn't have a clue who was responsible for the killings. The list of suspects who might have had a grudge against Tate and the others seemed to stretch all the way to the West Coast. They'd even interviewed the parents of Leah Betts. The only way they would get onto me would be through Mick or Jack, and I knew neither of them had been picked up, so I had to be in the clear. In the end, I was so intrigued by the whole thing, I decided to let my curiosity get the better of me, and meet up with Jim, after all. As it happens, it wasn't at all what I expected a cop to be like. But then again, I'd never been friends with a policeman in my entire life. We had a few drinks and a bit of a laugh, and I found I was really enjoying myself, in a funny sort of way, we had quite a lot in common. But as he told me more than once, as the beers started to disappear, he had an excellent arrest rate. It turned out that Jim was a bit of a maverick, who was always getting into trouble with his bosses, for not doing things quite by the book, and was basically one of the most successful detectives in the whole of Essex. I needed to make sure there would be no comeback on me, but Jim was going on about how good he was at protecting his contacts. I still wanted to put it to the test though. After a few meetings, including one where Jim had invited me around to his house, I started to feel more comfortable with him. It was almost like he was a friend who just happened to work for the police rather than anything else. But he was never completely off duty. His priority was always getting information from me. Every now and again, he'd mention the name of some local tow rag and ask if I knew anything about what he was up to. Sometimes I told him, sometimes I didn't. He usually depended on how drunk I was. I was starting to trust him more and more and basically confess that during my drug smuggling days, which were long over, I'd been involved with a sizable load of duff cannabis, which had ended up chucking away. He got really excited and we jumped into the car and drove over to the fishing lake at Sandpit Lane and I pointed out where the drugs were. I was saying to him, it's about 50 kilos of puff. I'm sure it would look blinding on your record that you've had this astounding find because of your initiative. And he was like, yeah, yeah. He was getting really excited. He said if the cannabis was really there, I'd get a reward. And if there was any information I had on other people, I'd get more rewards for that as well. I made it pretty clear there was plenty more I could say about other stuff going on. But he had to do his bit by making sure my name wasn't linked to the find in the lake. If he did that, then I'd lead him to some bigger fish. Not surprisingly, Jim got really excited and promised there would be no comeback. Within a day or two, he'd arranged for a diving team to go out and have a look at the place. I had to laugh when I saw the headlines of the local paper. To protect me, they announced that the Essex diving team were on a routine training mission at the lake and they just happened to find all the cannabis. Jim also told me, as each and every bar was pulled out of the water, he wiped it down to ensure my fingerprints would never be found. The papers put the street value at something like a hundred thousand, which was a bit mad considering it was all cack, and the reason we chucked it away was because we couldn't even give it away. When the news broke about the find, Mick was straight on the phone. I actually hadn't told him what I'd done with the cannabis. After all, he just told me to get rid of it. I don't think he cared, as long as he didn't have to look after it anymore. But he called up and said, Is that ours? Did you dump it in the sandpit? Mick was most worried about whether they'd find his fingerprints on the puff. I calmly told him not to worry, that I'd wipe down every bar before I chucked it in. Great, nice one Darren, he said, and then he was gone again. Jim seemed to be keeping up with his end of the bargain. I began to realise there was a pretty good chance of the rest of my plan working out. The very next day, Mick called me again and asked if I could pop round as he might have something for me. He was talking about drugs, of course. It was all going like clockwork. The future was looking rosy. When it came to collecting the reward, Jim told me I'd have to become a registered informant and meet his governor. If I wanted to stay anonymous, it would also mean coming up with a plausible story about how I knew the cannabis was in the lake. Jim suggested I say I'd overheard a conversation in a pub with a couple of dealers talk about having hidden some dope there. The final step was to come up with a code, one that didn't relate to any other villain or any other real person that either of us knew. It's not as easy as you think, and after what seemed like hours of stupid or useless suggestions, we settled on Ken Rugby, 
because Jim's son was in the school rugby team and Ken was the name of his instructor. Using a false name was always a way of protecting me. Along with our cover story, it meant the top cop brass didn't need to know anything about me or my personal drug connections. I met Jim's governor in the car park of the Dolphin pub and told him about the made up story. He said brilliant and counted me out £400 in £10 notes. I signed for the money as Ken Rugby and waved goodbye as he left. As soon as he was out of sight, Jim held out his hand and said, Bottle of scotch? I paused for a second and counted him out £50 from the money I'd been given. It should have been another one of them times when warning bells were ringing in my head, but I just didn't see it. I mean, we spent ages making up this totally false story so that I could get the money in the first place. I wouldn't have got any of it without him, so sharing the wealth seemed a decent thing to do. I'd been teasing Jim somewhat rotten about the other stuff I knew, and he was so keen to find out about it that he started making all sorts of promises to get me on side. I'd mentioned to him I was really interested in getting the burger van in the area, because you can make some really good money from them. My bank had already agreed to give me the loan, but the hard part was getting the license. Without it, you just get moved on every couple of hours and spend all your time paying fines. Jim said he had a friend at the council and that if I helped him out, he'd make sure I got my license. It was almost too good to be true. I was going to get rid of Mick and Jack. I wasn't going to get into trouble myself and I was going to be able to set up my own business. There was no room for doubt. Meeting Jim had to be the best thing that had ever happened to me. It had happened more than two years earlier, but I still hadn't forgiven Alan Richards. It was one of those Christmas parties where everyone was drinking too much and I wasn't going to be left behind. But after a couple of hours, I started to feel really ill and decided to go home early. Maybe it was something I ate. Sandra was having a good time. Richards, who I knew fairly well, because he used to go out with one of Sandra's sisters, so he'd drop her home for me. When the time came, Sandra got in Richard's car, and off they went. Only he didn't take her to our place, he took her to his place, which was in the middle of nowhere. And once they got there, he started going on about how he was too drunk to drive, and I should have to stay the night. She tried calling me, but I was too far gone to hear the phone, so she had to sleep, fully clothed on his sofa. Richard tried it on a couple of times, but obviously didn't get anywhere. Even though nothing happened, Sandra knew I'd be really pissed off about the whole thing, and she was right. Although we'd been sort of friends, I didn't have a lot of time for Richards, even before the thing with Sandra. He worked as a car sprayer, and he used to hire someone to go out and pot key scratches down the side of every nice car in his neighbourhood, just to generate business for himself. So I always thought he was a bit of a scumbag. I finally ran into him a couple of days later, I wanted to tear his head off, but he started crying like a little baby and saying, please don't hit me and all that. His excuse for that night was a classic. He was so drunk that he forgot that she was in the car with him and he'd just driven home. I walked away. Ever since then, whenever our paths have crossed, he would try to clear the air and offer to buy me endless drinks. Me, being the well-adjusted, sensible adult that I am, would mercenarily rip the piss out of him at every opportunity, winding him up and showing him up in front of everyone. Richards happened to be a friend of Jim. In fact, he was the man who'd borrowed the XR3 eye and written it off. On this particular night, Jim was in the pub, actually sitting next to Richards, while I took the piss out of him. Richards was getting more and more upset, not just because of what I was saying, but also because he considered Jim to be a really good friend of his. But rather than standing up for him, Jim was just giggling to himself. Richards, Finally had enough, I stood up and said the two of us should go and talk outside. I was getting really into it by then, really enjoying the wind-up, so I pretended I misunderstood what it said. I was going, fucking great idea, you and me outside, right now, come on in, let's go, let's go get it on. Richards was horrified and sat back down immediately, saying, no, not like that. But as he sat down, his chair collapsed, he ended up rolling around on the floor. Everyone in the pub started laughing at this point and Richards sulked off with some excuse about needing to use the toilet while I started trying to put his chair back together. It was like a jigsaw puzzle and I was bashing bits with my hand and all sorts when the landlord saw me, came over and accused me of trying to smash the place up. He went mad. His first words were, people like you. And then he started going on about how thugs were putting him out of business 
and how important it was to respect people's property. I was on my feet straight away. What do you mean people like me? I shouted back. The guy was a little fucker and I was towering above him. I threw the bits of the chair back on the floor and told him to poke it up his ass because I hadn't done anything wrong. As I walked away, Jim and the others explained to the landlord what had happened and he came running over to apologise and promised me drinks on the house for the rest of the night. But I was still fuming, so I went out into the car park to calm down. Jim came out with me and we started chatting about various dealers around the town and how to catch them at it. He was telling me that I could trust him completely because nothing I said would ever be official unless I wanted it to be. So I basically told him, Mick was a big time drug smuggler. In an instant, Jim started to get really excited. He was saying, you've got to get back in with him. Yeah, 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 get in with him. I was asking how. The only time he ever spoke to me was when I was buying drugs off him. Jim told me to buy drugs off him to find out when the next big shipment was coming in. But what shall I do with the puff that I buy from Mick? I asked him. Sell it, of course. Fair enough. In fact, if you let me know where you sell it to, I can go around and nick them. That's a bit strong, isn't it? You're kidding, ain't you? There was a pause. We'd both been drinking heavily. I was a bit fuzzy-headed, but even then, it was obvious that it was completely serious. Of course I am, he said at last. Somewhere in my head, alarm bells were ringing, but I was so swept up in the idea of Mick being arrested that I just ignored them. The thing is, I had no idea what it actually means to be an informant, how it actually works. On TV, it seems to involve nothing, but wearing a really bad shirt and hanging around in dodgy pubs and sitting next to cops in their cars and telling them the word on the street. The reality is probably very different, but Jim never sat me down and gave me a lesson or handed me over some police pamphlet of how to be at grass, so I just made it up as I went along. The unwritten rule so far as I saw it was that I was allowed to buy drugs from Mick, sell them on in the usual way, keep any profit that I made for myself, just so long as I always kept Jim informed about what I was doing. No problem. The idea of me stitching up my friends, proper friends that is, not people like Mick, just to make Jim look good, was really bothering me, right out of order. But then the conversation drifted off into some other area. I really can't remember what. By the time we went back inside, Richards had vanished. It didn't matter how many different ways he tried looking at it. The conclusion was always the same. And Richards had hardly got any sleep that night. Instead he went over the events of the evening again and again in his mind. It started when Nichols had started taking the piss out of him. And Jim hadn't said anything. This just wasn't fair. After all, Richards had given Jim information on the Essex criminal underworld for months now before they'd established a good friendship. Richards had been involved in a wide range of petty criminal activities and Jim had encouraged him to maintain his contacts so that he'd have more information to pass on to him. What disturbed him most though was what he'd witnessed when he came back from the toilet after his chair collapsed. Through the pub window, it's in Nichols and Jim talking in the car park. There was something about the way their lips were moving, the way their eyes were shifting as they spoke. Richards knew. He just knew they were talking about him. Not just talking about him. He felt convinced they were planning to set him up. Early the next morning, sweating profusely and shivering with fear, Alan Richards walked into the police headquarters in Chelmsford. I'd like to speak to a senior officer. I have some information about one of your officers who has been involved in numerous criminal activities and I can prove it. Skimming money off the payouts to his informants and falsifying his records was just the tip of the iceberg. Jim was into much worse than that. He took bribes to lose bits of evidence. He lied to those he worked with. Turned a blind eye to serious criminal offences. Jim was playing a dangerous game. He was burning the candle at both ends and then, for good measure, setting light to the middle as well. He may have been the one with a warrant card, but in the eyes of his informants, he was more of a crook than some of the people he arrested. Of all the people in the whole of Essex that Darren Nichols could have chosen to confess all to, Detective Constable Jim had to be just about the worst. Blissfully unaware of the massive surveillance operation that was in place against him, 
Michael Steele was gearing up for a big return to the drug smuggling business. It was pretty obvious to those watching that the driver of the black Mercedes was somehow involved, but it took Dibley and his team a little while to work out exactly who it was. When the positive ID came through, they were surprised to say the least. Darren Nichols could hardly believe it either. Mick had asked me to meet him outside his parade of shops in South End, and when I arrived his car was already there, with Paul Gwennett in the passenger seat. Mick was in a bit of a funny mood. He started telling me about this big row he was having with his new smuggling partner. He said he'd just bought over 80 kilos of cannabis, and given the bloke a really good price of just £200 per kilo for importing. The reason he'd given such a discount was because the guy had said once it was in the country, he'd be able to sell loads at a discount price of 1600 per kilo, sell it on for 2200 per kilo, and make his money that way. But once they'd got back, the bloke had sold all the dope straight away, leaving nothing for Mick. That's what you get for dealing with a Tate, he said bitterly. A Tate? What do you mean? I didn't you know. I didn't I tell you. My new business partner. It's Russell Tate, Pat's brother. I wasn't sure what I found more shocking, that Mick was now dealing with the brother of a man he'd watched squealing like a baby before emptying both barrels of his shotgun into his belly, or the fact that I'd missed out on a smuggling run. If only I'd known a bit sooner, I could have told Jim. The whole gang would have been arrested, and all my worries would have vanished overnight. Either way, I was just coming out of my shock a few seconds later when I heard Mick saying that he had something for me, which was what he always said to me, when he had drugs for me to sell. He put out a plastic bag from the space behind the cab in the truck and walked over to my car. On the way, I asked him if the thing with Russell was going to be regular and reliable. If I was going to get him arrested, I needed as much information as possible. Mick told me they had a totally new way of doing it, which was much better and much more profitable than the one I'd been involved in. Basically, three cars would drive down to Spain, where using his contacts... Russell was able to buy Puff for just £750 per kilo. Three cars would then head back north in convoy. The drugs would be in the middle car and the other two vehicles would be spaced out, one a mile or so ahead and the other a mile or so behind. That way, if either car thought they saw anything suspicious or thought they were being followed, they could radio the middle car and give them a chance to change the route or dump the drugs. The real clever part was that Tate's gang included a couple of women. Rather than a bunch of single blokes travelling on their own, which always looked suspicious, each car in the convoy looked like a couple off on their holidays. The cars would then come up through France and then Belgium, where the drugs would be driven to the beach at Blankenberg and Mick would meet them on his boat. As far as the argument with Russell was concerned, Mick said that had all been sorted out. From now on, Mick would be putting his own money into each deal in addition to whatever cash Russell was carrying. Once in Spain, Russell would buy as much cannabis as Mick could afford, all at the cost of 750 per kilo, and bring it up with the rest of the convoy free of charge. In return, Mick would continue to charge Tate £200 per kilo for his smuggling services. Under his new arrangement, Mick was more than trebling each pound he invested so he was desperately trying to pull in all the money he possibly could for the next run. Jack Wombs and Paul Gwennett had each put in a good few thousand, and Mick had also invested the money he made from selling his mum's house in Point Clare. He asked me if I could let him have the money from the two kilos as soon as possible, because he wanted to put that in as well. I said I tried to sell the drugs, but it was difficult because all the customers wanted regular supplies. Could he guarantee that I'd get some from the next load, as it was going to be huge, more than 150 kilos. The same afternoon, I sold all the drugs I'd been given in one go for just £250 over the cost of 4400 Mick was waiting on the money and wanted to make sure that nothing delayed the deal. Seeing Mick and Jack behind bars was, after all, far more important than making a few quid. When I handed over the cash the following morning, Mick was getting really hyped up, like a little kid about to go to the fair or something. He told me that Tate and the others were planning to leave for Spain that very evening. As soon as I got back home, I rang Jim and told him all about it. I could hear him making noises in the background and started to feel sick and dizzy with excitement. This was it. Soon, it would all be over. Now the only thing left to do was sit back and wait.
I knew it was roughly a two week trip for Tate and Co to go down to Spain and back, so I wasn't surprised when 10 days later, a week before my birthday, Mick asked if I could rent a car for him. He insisted that he wasn't planning to do anything illegal with it, just that he needed the car to go down to Portsmouth for a meeting and didn't want to be seen in his own car. He had a few endorsements on his license, so it was difficult for him to hire cars himself. I knew that it was probably lying to me, but I didn't care because I knew the next shipment was getting really close. His days were numbered, and as long as I told Jim everything that was happening, I'd always be in the clear. But when I phoned Jim, I discovered he'd buggered off to Spain to sort out some problem on a villa he owned out there. This was not good news. What with him being a bit of a maverick, not particularly keen on paperwork, I felt incredibly unsafe knowing he wasn't around in person to defend me. But by then, I'd already agreed to get the car for Mick. No one seemed to know how long Jim was going to be away for. So all I could do was hope he would come back in time to catch the shipment coming in before I found myself in any more trouble. I arranged to hire a Mondeo from Budget rent car of Chelmsford and Mick picked me up around 5pm to take me down to their offices. On the way, he said he only needed the car that evening and that he would pay all the charges and let me keep the car for a week to make up for any inconvenience. He'd also lend me his high lux to drive home in and he would drop the Mondeo back at my place at 5am on the dot. The time I normally got up to go for work. On the outside I was smiling and nodding but inside, I was shaking my head and saying, you're a fucking liar, mate. And if what Mick was saying was true, it would be the first time in the four years that I'd known him that he'd ever given me something for nothing. I went to bed that evening and got up just before 5am to call Mick. I didn't want him calling the house in case he woke Sandra and the kids up. I dialed his mobile and he answered straight away, saying he'd be with me in about 15 minutes and I should get the kettle on. I was watching out the window when I saw Jack's transit van pull up and Mick and Jack step out. There was no sign of the Mondeo. They both came in and we all sat around the kitchen table. Mick had some tea, Jack had some orange squash and we all talked about bits of bollocks until I got fed up of ignoring the obvious and asked what the hell had happened to the hired car. Mick took a deep breath, then started to explain. Tate and the others had got the drugs and had arrived in Blankenburg a couple of days earlier. The problem was, the weather was too bad for Mick to set sail. The sea was so rough, it made the storm the two of us had been in the year before seem like a night in the bath. The car with the drugs had been parked up near the port for three days. Now Tate was getting increasingly worried that the police would get suspicious. Mick and Jack had driven the Mondeo over so the drugs could be transferred to its boot and buy them a bit more time. They also taken Tate's gang some cash, because none of them had expected to stay in Belgium for that long and they were starting to run a bit short. As Mick spoke, I just sat there listening. None of it came as a surprise. It was all pretty much as I expected. I didn't care about the car. I just wanted to know when he was setting off on the boat and hoped to God that Jim would be back in time to do his stuff. When do you think you'll be going over then? I asked. Well, the weather is starting to get a bit better. I think tomorrow... But if not then, Sunday night at the latest, you could then get the Mondeo back on Monday afternoon. Okay, fine. Just let me know when you leave. Sarja and I have always had pretty good sex, even after the kids and all that. But I'd have to say that the biggest orgasm of my life had nothing to do with her. It came late on Saturday night, soon after I answered the telephone and heard Jim's voice telling me that he was back in the country. Yes! Oh God, yes! I couldn't get the words out fast enough. I was speaking so fast that no one could have a clue what I was talking about. And it took a while and several attempts before Jim understood what was happening. I'd spoken to Steele earlier in the day and knew he was planning on setting off that afternoon. He'd be back in the early hours of Monday morning. This was it. This was really it. But then, something incredible happened. Jim said he wasn't going to do anything about it. The thing is, Darren, each time they go... They're bringing back bigger and bigger shipments, he told me. They invest all the profits they make back into the business. If we let it run, then we'll be able to catch them with a really massive load. And in the meantime, we'll be able to do lots of good work with the drugs that you buy as well. I really didn't like the last bit. I was focusing on the idea of Mick being caught with hundreds of kilos, enough to make sure that he went away for a very long time. 
Mick called me the following morning and told me the Monday I was at his house and that I could collect it. I got my wife to drop me off at his house and then we got in Mick's car to drive to the Robin Hood pub because he'd left the Monday in the car park. My heart sank. Why'd he parked it there? Mick almost looked embarrassed as he explained that the car had been pulled up and searched twice over. The reason they pulled it was because the driver couldn't remember my name. The name the car had been hired in. Who the hell was driving it? Some silly fucking South African. I told them your name. All they had to do was say they'd borrowed it off you when you were drunk to come over on a day trip. Mick told me to expect police or customs to come round and ask about the car. And just to make up an excuse if they did. While he was saying all this, I sat in the Mondeo and switched the engine on. It was empty. I complained to Mick and eventually he gave me 30 quid. When I took the car home, I had a closer look at it and found loads of small scratches. I was more worried about the £150 excess that I might lose than the fact that someone else had driven the car because I knew getting any more money out of Mick was like getting blood out of a stone. I took the car back early and I spent the rest of the night dreaming of the day that he would get caught. I'd got my fingers burned with a Mondeo, but this was different. I had an E-Reg Jaguar for sale, which had been in the paper for a couple of weeks, with not much interest, when Mick phoned me up and said he was interested in buying it. He and Peter Corey turned up at my house about 5pm, and Corey took the car for a drive around the block. Once he'd got back, Mick said he'd give me £3,000 for it, and we shook hands on it. We never talked about it in detail, but I knew Mick was hoping to use it to tow the boat and trailer, rather than always using Jack's transit van. I didn't care what he did with it. Once he brought it, the car was out of my hands, and nothing to do with me. Mick said he didn't have that amount of money on him at the moment, but he'd pay me after the weekend. No problem, Mick. Do you and Peter fancy a cup of tea? We're in a bit of a hurry, actually, Darren, said Mick. We'd better get going. And they did, with Mick driving in his Hilux and Corey in the Jaguar. As soon as they'd gone, I sent a message to Jim's pager. Tell him to call Darren urgently, I told the woman. A few minutes later, he called me on my mobile. Transcript of covertly recorded telephone conversations. Source, desk phone of DC Jim. Internal Investigation Bureau. Date, the 9th of the 5th, 1996. Hello? Right? You can save money and ring me at home if you want. Oh, it's the firm's phone. Well, he's been round. He wanted to buy my Jag. They'll be back up around Tuesday, because they're now in possession of what they want. Yeah? They're coming back. Right. Because he said to me, I'm trying to use different vehicles for everything. He said because the amount of times that Jack has used the same motor to pick the gear up off the beach. They also want to use it to run some dirt abroad. Right. That's good, that is. So really all you've got to do is steal that car when it goes abroad next time and keep the loot. That wouldn't be a fucking bad idea, would it? That'd be a bloody good idea. Wouldn't that be nice between us? Yeah. It would be like a hundred and something odd thousand pound? More than that, actually, no. It'd be about 150 grand, I reckon. Oh. There's a lot of gear down where they're going. Yeah, exactly. He wants to buy my Land Rover to put the boat in sometime next week. Just thought I'd tell you. Urge to catch someone. Oh no, 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 let it run. Because you have a little bit of play around here anyway. Yeah. Oh, blind me. You'll be able to get loads of people. I dish it out like sweets. As long as you get paid for it. Well, I'll make sure that I get the cash before I tell you. Exactly. End of tape. I was really starting to get worried about Jim. He was still on about this idea of me selling drugs to people and then him nicking them. It hadn't happened yet though. He had a weird way of working. There were some things he'd tell me that I'm sure I was never supposed to hear, but others that he would keep mum about. I wondered whether everything he was saying, including all the stuff about letting Mick and Jack carry on for now, was just some kind of smokescreen. After all, I couldn't work out why he wasn't jumping up and down with excitement at the prospect of bringing them in. Surely that was worth far more kudos than half a dozen small-time street dealers. Maybe he was just being cool. Or maybe... He was just being crap. I was starting to lose faith that it was ever going to happen. But I'd travelled so far down the road with him, there was no point in turning back. I just had to keep going. To take things off my mind, I spent most of Friday night and a fair amount of Saturday morning working out what I was going to do with the money from the drag. 
So when Mick called me up later that morning to say he didn't want it after all, I felt as though part of my world had collapsed. In order to be capable of pulling the boat, the Jaguar needed a tow bar fitted. But because it was one of the models with a digital dashboard, it needed a special module, which was going to take forever to order. Instead, Mick asked if he could borrow the Land Rover, and when I agreed, he told me to come over and pick up the Jag when I dropped the Land Rover off. I had a few things to do that day, so I didn't set off for Meadow Cottage until Saturday afternoon. Once I had arrived, Mick drove me in his high lux over to the Robin Hood car park, where he'd left the Jaguar. He said he'd put £30 worth of petrol in the car, He'd also buy me a drink sometime to make up for the inconvenience. For the first time in a long time, I felt a twinge of guilt. There I was, trying my hardest to get this boat nicked, and all of a sudden, he was treating me with a bit of respect. I didn't hear from Mick again until Sunday morning, when he asked me if I could do him a huge favour. I him a lift up to meet Jack that afternoon. We arranged to meet in a pub near Great Bentley Village, and I set off in my Jack in the middle of the afternoon. I was waiting in the car park when Mick turned up in his Toyota RAV4, being driven by Jackie Street. Paul Gwennett was also in the car. Mick and Paul took a couple of bags and some fishing rods out of the Toyota and put them in the back of my car before both getting in. Where to, Gov? I asked Mick. It was pretty obvious I'd been magically transformed into a cab driver for the day, so I thought I might as well act like one. Mick told me to go up to the A12 towards the Ipswich roundabout. More than once he told me not to drive so fast. When we got to the cop dock roundabout, he told me to turn right and stop at the first petrol station I saw. I did so, and saw Jack already in the garage with his blue transit towing a trailer carrying the boat. We all got out and went to the garage while Jack filled the boat with petrol. I thought I'd be leaving him there, but Mick told me he wanted to drive him and Gwennett to Leventon Marina. We stopped in a lay-by just outside, and Mick and Paul opened up the bags and put on a couple of dry suits. Then they unstrapped the boat, removed the number plates and made it ready to go straight into the water. I watched the boat go out to sea and then Jack told me to meet him in the lay-by. He was refitting the trailer when I pulled up behind him and got in the transit. So how come you're not involved in our business these days? He asked me. He was sitting in the driver's seat, staring forward towards the windscreen. It was like he was trying to be cool or something. I scratched my head. Well, you know, I don't have my passport anymore. But the main thing is, it just wasn't worth it. I never really earned any money out of it. Jack nodded slowly, still staring straight ahead. Well, if he invested a bit of money in it, he continued, then you'd make a lot more. Mick and I were talking, and we wanted you to go down to Spain and run that part of the operation for us. We think you'd be good at it. We pay all your expenses and everything. It's a good offer. I'm not really interested. I don't really think this is the right business for me. Especially after what happened at Christmas. Jack's face suddenly erupted into a cheesy smile. Which faded as quickly as it appeared. Then he looked directly at me for the first time. Here's the thing Darren. We want you to get more involved. If you don't, that's going to cause problems. What happened to Pat? could easily happen to you. You can be replaced. I suddenly got this weird situation, like I was flying backwards really fast. I wanted to be sick. I felt my legs buckle, and my throat dried in an instant. I thought I was going to faint, and I had to hold on to the side of the transit to steady myself. I couldn't speak. I was numb with shock. Jack had just threatened to kill me. I was speechless. I'll probably call you later tonight, Jack said. I might need you to do us a favour. It won't be a problem, will it? I looked at him. His eyes were dead. There was no humour in his face at all. He was like a machine. It crossed my mind that he'd probably had exactly the same look on his face when he carried out the murders. I forced out some words. No, Jack. That won't be a problem at all. I was feeling a bit brave when I went to bed. So I switched my phone off. I woke up about 5pm feeling like an absolute pansy and dialed 1471. Jack had called me about 2.30am. Shit. I decided to call him back and pretend I'd fallen asleep. Why? Well, I still felt involved in the whole murder thing. I didn't think I could just walk away from things just like that. 
Oh yeah, and I was terrified of what he might do if he thought I was avoiding him. But at the back of my mind, I was really hoping that Jim had done his job and it'd all be banged up. I got through to Jack right away and he sounded really pleased to hear from me. He'd been fast asleep and he did get out to meet the boat when he came back into the harbour. Is everything okay? I asked softly. Yeah, said Jack brightly. Everything's fine. No problems at all. You can pick up your Land Rover whenever you want. It's over at Mix. Okay, will do, I said, and put the phone down. And then I swore to myself, over and over, until Sandra woke up and asked what I was going on about. My workmate Colin was due round at any time, so I thought I might as well take advantage of the extra pair of hands and pick up the Land Rover right away. Once he had arrived, I drove the two of us over to Mix in the Jag, then the two of us headed back towards Braintree in our little two-car convoy. I'm not the paranoid type, but as we were on our way back, I had this feeling I was being followed. I knew it didn't make any sense. I mean, I hadn't done anything, but I just had this weird, prickly sensation on the back of my neck. But every time I thought I spotted the car that was tailing me, it would turn off or something. So I guessed it was all just in my mind and soon forgot about it. But as we were heading back, just before 5.30am, my phone went off. It was Mick on his mobile. We're fishing at sea. It's been a good night. We'll see you later on. Jack's going to get us out, he said. Cheers, Mick. See you later, I replied. Then I started swearing to myself again. Up until that moment, I was hoping that maybe Mick had been arrested and Jack didn't know about it. No such luck. By the time I got home, I was so depressed about the fact that another drug run had been allowed to slip by that I couldn't be bothered to do any work. At least not until later. I sent Colin home and I went to bed. Mick phoned me up a bit later and asked me to go round about 1pm. All the way there, I still got the feeling someone was watching me. I was almost 100% certain that the police were watching me. Eventually, it got so bad that I phoned Jim. Oi, am I under surveillance? Are you lot following me? No, don't be stupid, Darren, came the reply. You're just being paranoid. I don't think so, mate. I'm sure I've been surveyed. I've been paranoid before, but it doesn't feel anything like this. I'm telling you, Darren, you're not being followed. If you were, I'd tell you, wouldn't I? I mean, I'm not going to fuck you about, am I? You're on our side. Just relax. All right, listen, though. The shipment came in last night. I'm just going over to pick up my share. I know, said Jim. Mick's got it in his mum's garage. He hasn't even bothered to lock it up. Don't worry. Everything is under control. Relax. I tried my best, but it just wasn't quite good enough. In fact, I'd been so distracted that I completely forgot to ask Jim how he knew where the drugs were. It almost sounded like he'd been over there himself to check it out. Maybe something was going to happen after all. When I eventually arrived at Mix, he was sitting in a chair by his caravan at the front of Meadow Cottage, sunning himself. He asked how much puff I wanted to take away with me. I've got 10 if that's okay, but it's more if you want it. 10 kilos, 22,000 pounds worth. He obviously had it coming out of his ears. That was more than enough. I opened up the toolbox and Mick threw in the bars, counting each one off until he reached 40. As they hit the bottom of the toolbox, I rearranged them neatly in order. I'd made Colin wait around the corner. I didn't want him getting involved. But when I returned, I put the toolbox of the drugs in the back of the van and let him drive with me, following behind in the Jag. We set off for home and I phoned Sandra to let her know what time I'd be back. Just as I put the phone down, Mick called. He sounded really frustrated, like he'd been working himself up into a frenzy. He asked if there was anything in the Land Rover when I picked it up that morning. I told him there wasn't, that I'd checked it carefully, and it was completely empty. Mick launched into a furious torrent of swear words down the line. What's wrong? I asked, totally confused. Why do you want to know? I could hear Mick's breathing getting harder and harder. Because I fucking lost something, that's why. Then he hung up. It only took me a few seconds to realise it must be some of the drugs that had gone missing. As soon as I clicked, I was overcome with a huge fear that Mick might have thought I was responsible, that I was trying to rip him off. What with Jack being on the warpath and having threatened me the night before, that was the last thing I wanted. I phoned Mick back immediately. Have you lost what I think you've lost? He was still fuming. Yes, I fucking have. I assured him 
There was nothing at all in the Land Rover. OK, OK, he said, and hung up again. I was so caught up in what Mick was saying that I barely noticed the half dozen police cars ahead of me and behind me until they switched their sirens on. A couple of them pulled right in front, forcing me and Colin to stop. All I could see ahead of me was blue flashing lights and dozens of uniforms heading towards me. Quick as a flash, I locked all the doors in the jag, wound up all the windows, pulled out my mobile and started dialing like a maniac. As soon as I heard Mick's voice, I spoke. I'm being arrested, I said. The mixture of fear and excitement must have done something to my voice because Mick didn't recognise me. Who's that? He said. It's Darren. I'm being nicked. There was a pause and I thought I heard him swear and then the line went dead. By now, two or three coppers were banging on the windows of the Jag telling me to put the phone down and get out of the car. I dialed again. Sandra picked up on the second ring. Sandra, I won't be home after all. I'm being stopped by the police. I'll try and call you later. Bye. Outside the car, the coppers were frantically trying to get in. They had taken out the truncheons and were tapping them on the glass. They started telling me in a really nasty way what was going to happen if I didn't open the door there and then. But I had one more call to make. He wasn't at his desk, so I called his pager. TC Jim's messaging service, said the woman. Can I take your message, please? Yeah, the message is... I'm being fucking nicked. There was a stunned silence. I'm sorry, sir, the woman said. I don't think I could send that particular message. I was looking out the window and I could see the cop nearest me contempting to break the glass. I had to act fast. All right, just tell him that Darren has been arrested. The last two phone calls I had no problem with. But up until this day, I can't explain why I called Mick, let alone why I called him first. It's a complete mystery. After all, I've been doing everything in my power to engineer him being arrested for weeks, so it made no sense at all for when I thought it was finally happening to tip him off and give him the chance to get away. The only reason I can come up with is that I wanted to protect myself, to stop him thinking that his arrest was anything to do with me. Stupid, really. But I guess I wasn't thinking straight at the time. The second I stepped out of the car, they grabbed the phone off me and handcuffed my hands behind my back while I watched Colin being led off to a police van. Do you know why you're being pulled up? Said the copper nearest me. I shook my head. Where have you come from? He said. Colchester, I replied. Well, said the policeman, trying to think on his feet. There have been a number of burglaries in Colchester and we've pulled you over because we'd like to search your van. I nodded. Okay, fair enough. But everything that van is mine. Colin is just driving it for me. He has nothing to do with anything. It's all down to me. It didn't take them long to find the toolbox. There wasn't anything else in the back of the van. What are these then? Said the policeman. I thought I'd played a fool one last time. They look like chocolate bars to me. What do you think they are? The policeman smiled. I think they're drugs. And that was that. I was arrested on the spot. They took me down to Chelmsford Police Station. All the way there and when we arrived, I kept looking out for Jim. I kept expecting him to pop up at any moment and say, no, this one's okay. He's on our side. I was sure this was all down to him. Then he finally swooped and the reason I'd been arrested was to stop Mick and Jack from suspecting that I'd grasped them up. They let Colin go home after a couple of hours. They realised he had nothing to do with anything illegal. But he wasn't allowed to make any phone calls or see anyone for ages. They interviewed me for the first time just before 11.30pm and they were asking me loads of questions about the cannabis that they'd found in my van and where it had come from. I was just going no comment to the whole lot, no matter what they said. I'd only been selling the drugs because Jim had told me to keep him with Mick. In my mind at least, I hadn't done anything wrong. I was sure it was all going to be fine. But then, they played their trump card. Essex Police. Record of tape recorded interview. Chelmsford Police Station, the 13th of the 5th, 96. The time, 23, 26 hours. Detective Constable Winston. We believe that you were in convoy today and you were playing an active part in the transportation of 10 kilos of cannabis resin and you were being asked to make some form of comment about that. Do you wish to say anything at this time? No comment. 
I draw your attention to the fact that if you refuse to answer this question, it may affect any answers you give at your trial. Do you understand that? No comment. Right. And lastly, that a record is being made, as I've said of this tape, and should you later be prosecuted, this will be brought up at your trial. Do you understand that? No comment. Right, okay. Well, if that is it, you've got the notice. I don't intend to say any more about the possession with intent to supply at the moment. The time by my watch now is 23.35 hours, and you're now going to be arrested for being involved in the murder of Pat Tate, Craig Rolfe, and Tony Tucker. Do you wish to make any comment to the fact you've now been arrested for that murder? No comment. They were trying to gauge a reaction, and I didn't make one. But as soon as they switched the tape off, I went mad. What the fuck do you think you're doing? Arresting me for that? I said. This is my worst nightmare coming true. And where the fuck was Jim? The following day, the evidence against him was starting to mount up. Nichols was beginning to realise how hopeless his situation was. In addition to all the police and customs surveillance records, which now included still photos and video footage, the police also had access to phone records of both Nichols and Steele. Again, Nichols took the no comment road, but it was obvious it was being backed into a corner. In fact, with neither Steele or Wones being caught in possession of drugs, there was more evidence against him than anyone else. And then, once again, just when things were looking at their bleakest, they got even worse. Just to put it in a nutshell here, Darren, what we're actually saying is, there's been a large importation of cannabis resin to the country. You've now been shown to be very privy, immediately before this importation came about, by your association with Steele and the others. You have now subsequently, in the very early hours of the next morning, been involved directly in the importation of these drugs. Your vehicle has subsequently been forensically examined, and there is salt water and a large amount of sand consistent with having been on the beach consistent with the importation taking place. You have been shown by surveillance to have been involved in the collection of a consignment of 10 kilos of cannabis resin. As far as I'm concerned, you're a large player in the ongoings that have happened. You were so concerned at the time you were being stopped that your first thought was to try to tell Mr Steele that it had all come on top as far as you were concerned. I feel in the light of this summary, you should reconsider your situation. I want you to understand the enormity of what I'm saying to you. Do you understand that? No comment. Fine. Now, I have here a copy of your custody record from last night. The entry is timed at 21.16. It says, While carrying out the review, Mr Nichols asked if he could speak to a nominated police officer known to him. I passed this to Superintendent Story, who declined this, and Nichols was informed of the above. Would you like to make any comment about that? No comment. Would you like to tell me who the police officer was that you wished to have some dialogue with at the time? No comment. Alright. Well, I can tell you at this moment, two police officers from Essex have been arrested and are currently in custody. Fuck. I don't fucking believe it. The officers have been charged with a number of offences, including some linked to the possession of controlled drugs. We have evidence that you have had numerous dealings with one of these officers. Is there any comments you wish to make now? No. No fucking comment. As soon as the interview was over, Nichols asked to see the most senior officer available. What happened next was recorded by DC Winston in his pocketbook. I was in the company with Detective Superintendent Barrington when we spoke to Darren Nichols in an interview room. Nichols had signed the custody record to be seen without a solicitor. This meeting had been requested by Mr Nichols, who was introduced to Mr Barrington. Nichols asked Mr Barrington if he named the arrested police officer, would he confirm it? Mr Barrington agreed. Mr Nichols said, is it DC Jim? Mr Barrington confirmed this, and then he, Nichols, went on to say this is how he'd gotten into trouble, and wanted to say how he'd been set up. Mr Barrington explained that regardless of what information Mr Nichols gave, that he would be responsible 
and would have to accept any sentence passed on him by the legal system. Mr Nichols accepted this and asked about what protection would be given to him and his family. Mr Barrington said Mr Nichols must be totally honest and all details given so that an accurate judgment could be made regarding the level of protection offered. Mr Nichols asked about protection in prison and was told about the system of protection that was available for a registered informants. Mr Nichols said that he would be given information regarding the legal activities of policemen and said he did not say anything to DC Winston because he did not know if he could trust him. Mr Barrington said that Mr Nichols could trust him fully and that he should tell him the whole truth of what his involvement was. Mr Nichols stated that he was a registered informant of DC Jim. Mr Barrington acknowledged this by stating that he knew all about that and that he did sanction the payment to him and that DC Winston had no involvement with DC Jim at all. Mr Nichols said that for the last six months he felt he was being used and that the drugs job was not his main concern and that other serious things would be disclosed. I knew I didn't have any choice. I tried to put myself in Mick and Jack's shoes to wonder what was going through their minds and pretty soon I realised I was totally fucked. Two days earlier, Jack had threatened to kill me. The next day he gets arrested. In Mick's case, I came round to collect some drugs and an hour later, he gets arrested. It was a good bet by now that I've also been told that a couple of policemen had been nicked and that was talking to one of them. It wouldn't take them long to put two and two together and even if they didn't work out I was given information about the smuggling side of things I was still the weak link in the murder case. And now the cops were talking about remanding me in custody in Chelmsford Prison. That's exactly where they were going to put Mick and Jack and the others. I wouldn't last five minutes. It was time to start talking. I don't know what I was expecting. Joining the Witness Protection Programme, becoming a supergrass, it all sounded quite glamorous and exciting. The truth is, it's nothing of the sort. A couple of days after I'd agreed to cooperate, I was taken out of my cell into a little interview room and had this little sheet of paper shoved in front of me. It had my full name at the top and the list of conditions I had to agree to. The first was I had to promise to plead guilty to three offences. Possession of 10 kilos of cannabis, supplying a firearm to a prohibited person and conspiracy to import drugs. The gun and the conspiracy charges really pissed me off. I'd never been caught doing either and there was no real evidence that I'd been involved at all. I was only being charged because I had admitted to them. But this was part of the deal. They had to admit to everything that I'd ever done. Being honest meant that if it all went pear-shaped, I was risking a sentence of at least double that I would have got for the drugs alone. The next condition was that I had to agree to attend court and testify in all cases involving Wombs, Steele and Corey. The next paragraph was about what the police were going to do for me. I started to concentrate really hard because I was keen to find out exactly what they said. But as I started reading, I realised they really weren't saying anything. They promised to provide me with a new name and new identity and then to put me back in the position I was before my arrest. I remember I called one of the cops and pointed to the last condition. Does this mean you're going to stick me in a battered old jag with 10 kilos of puff in the back? He didn't find it funny. I asked about my council house. I've been living there for five years. I would earned a nice discount. I was thinking of trying to buy it. Would they be able to arrange for me to get the same discount once I moved? The answer was no. Okay, would they be able to help me get a job? The answer was maybe. It was all very vague, nothing specific. They explained that it had to be like that because if there was anything in the contract that was rock solid, it might be deemed as an inducement to me testifying. So that was it. One and a half sides of A4, a couple of signatures, and then nothing to do but start telling everything that I knew and then wait to see if I could trust them. Once I decided to cooperate and tell everything I knew, the police didn't seem to know what to do with me. They were holding me in the female cell unit at Chelmsford Police Station for ages, but they'd armed guards at the entrance in case anyone tried to get to me. That made it bloody obvious to every visiting solicitor and prisoner that something special was going on. Eventually they moved me to Colchester, 
and kept the whole thing on a much lower profile. Because I was just in a police station rather than a proper prison, they didn't have any of the proper facilities. For months, I was still under caution, and all I was doing was making statements about the murders and the drugs. It meant I couldn't really have any visitors or talk to anyone about anything, so I quickly started to get really bored. They gave me a TV and a fridge, and I got Sandra to send over a video recorder and a Nintendo game system. Food was the biggest problem. There was no canteen at the Nick, so they had to send out for pizza or McDonald's or KFC. As for hot drinks, all they had was these prepaid vending machines that makes everything taste like water, with a little bit of dirt floating in it. The only thing I could bear was the hot chocolate, so whenever they used to offer me something, I used to go for that. I thought I'd stay there, in the police cells, until the trial. But then, once the statements were over, they said I had to go to prison. At first, I was terrified. I was sure I'd be attacked and killed within a few days. But then they explained, there was somewhere very special, somewhere very safe, just for people like me. It sounded dreadful. They told me everything was secret, but the first day I got there, everyone was saying to me, Oi, you're that geezer who grassed up them blokes over the triple murder, ain't ya? Then they all sat around me, like it was in a fucking listen with mother, and wanted to know all the details. At first they didn't want to say anything. I didn't know who any of these people were, and it really pissed me off they knew all about me. But after a while, I started getting into it. You had to. You do feel like you're part of a special club, and sitting around with everyone, chatting about what you have and haven't done is all part of the fun. It's also a club where you get to call each other names that in any other prison you get your face smashed in. There is one joke you hear in the unit at least 10 times a day and even then we still all laugh. It happens when someone asks to borrow some milk or cigarettes and promise to pay other people back. How can I trust you? Someone will say. You're a fucking grass. It was no Hollandsy Bay but it was good fun at times. It wasn't all laughs though. I know that prison is not supposed to be a holiday camp but the simple truth is Though we are at least partly supposed to be good guys, doing a decent thing and all that, we actually got treated far worse than any other prisoners. We had to cook all our own food because they didn't trust anyone else to cook it for us, just in case someone tried to poison someone. That's all very well in principle, but we only got the same food budget as other inmates. It works fine if you're buying stuff in bulk, but when you're only shopping for 12, it doesn't go very far at all. We also spent a lot of time locked in our cells just to make things easier when they were changing shifts. They started locking us up about 7.30pm, whereas the rest of the prison were not going back in their cells to at least another hour. We couldn't get any education or special activities because there wasn't enough of us. We couldn't use the rest of the exercise facilities in case we got attacked, so we had to make do with some really second-hand equipment. The funny thing was, they had all these measures to stop people getting to us, but all anyone had to do was turn up during visiting time and just walk straight in. Because we were supposed to be a secret, and no one knew which prison we were being kept in. The idea was any visitors and new people in the unit would ever turn up. So rather than being searched or having to provide identification like other visitors, all my friends and family had to do was turn up at the front gate, say Blogs 19, and they'd be walked straight through. The security was also pretty lax during visits to the unit itself. We didn't have a proper visiting room, so people just used to come into the main unit and hang about on the landing. We were not supposed to go into our cells, but no one ever paid attention to that, and people just got up to all sorts. They finally tightened it up, when one of the inmates, Eaton, got his girlfriend pregnant during one of her visits. He obviously didn't have any money he could give to her, so she tried suing the governor, saying it was his fault for letting her into Eaton's cell unsupervised. They say prisons are universities of crime. If that's true, some of the people in the blogs unit were studying for their PhDs. A couple of the drug smugglers I was in there with had actually done it all on purpose. They knew it was all coming on top for the gang, so one of them had volunteered to turn grass, give some evidence against a couple of the others to take the heat off the main operation. They got a reduced sentence, a couple of nobodies go away for decades, and the drugs still keep on coming in. These guys had so much money it was untrue. I remember once one of them was looking through some car magazines, and he started asking me about what car he should get his wife. The choice was between a brand new Mercedes or a Porsche. There was another guy, a chemist, who'd been making amphetamine and ecstasy for a big North London criminal gang. He had made millions. He had actually bought an island. He showed us some pictures of it, along with his houses, boats and aeroplanes. He had so much money 
that he used to pay people £10,000 a time just to leave the country with a suitcase full of money to take to Switzerland and pay into his private account. I learned a lot from my time being in the blogs unit, but the main thing I was told was never to trust the police. The other people that were there, some of them had been stitched up really badly. I'd find myself talking to people who'd been in the unit for five years. They would tell me what the police had said to them at the start, and I'd realise it was exactly the same thing that the police had told me a couple of days earlier. One guy, Paul, who'd been serving 15 years, his story scared me the most. I remember him telling me not to trust the police. Right now, he said, they need you. They really need you. Believe me, Darren, they'll treat you like a god, right up until the day of the verdict, then they drop you like a stone. Paul had good reason to be bitter. He'd been on remand in another prison after being caught with a gang of armed robbers in Ireland. He'd been a bit of a weak link, but was happy to keep his mouth shut and do his time. His mates didn't believe it though, and they had arranged to have him killed. One day, while he was out in the exercise yard, he was told to go towards the wall because he was going to be helped to escape. As he made his way over, something told him it wasn't right. He decided to follow his hunch and went straight back inside and was asked to be put into isolation. He soon found out that he was actually being set up to be shot. He turned supergrass the very next day. When it comes to the trial, the police had done a shit job of gathering evidence and everyone had just got off. That only left Paul and because he had admitted all this stuff that he hadn't been involved in, the judge gave him 15 years. I couldn't believe it. I wanted to cry for him. Not only that, it made me think I'd made the biggest mistake of my life by joining the scheme and agreeing to give evidence. But by then, it was too late. If Mick and Jack got off, then the judge might decide it was because I didn't do a good enough job and decide to sentence me to the full amount for the drugs, the guns, everything. For the first time, I realised that I could get 10 years while Mick and Jack would both walk free. On the 24th of February, 1997, Darren Nichols was granted bail on condition that he reside at the safe house with his family and adhere to certain guidelines. There was a strict curfew, which meant he was only able to leave his house between 8am and 8pm. He was never allowed to travel more than 25 miles from his front door. He was not allowed to seek any form of employment. Any breach would mean an immediate return to prison. At first, his wife Sandra enjoyed having her husband back but the dream quickly turned into a nightmare. The murder trial was set to begin at the Old Bailey on the 1st of September, and as the weeks went by, Sandra watched her husband become more and more frustrated, more and more stressed, and increasingly bitter and angry about his situation and what the future held for him. As the trial loomed even nearer, Darren Nichols became more and more nervous about what might happen. In particular, in prospect of Mick and Jack going free played on his mind. He found it impossible to talk about it with his wife, who was becoming increasingly bitter about the enforced separation from her family. His police handlers had no time for him as he was making statements. Desperate for an outlet, Nichols began to make a video diary of his thoughts and feelings. He began filming himself at home. Such was his relief at being able to offload his anxieties, he even smuggled the camera into his prison cell to help him cope with the stresses and strains in the final days before the trial. The following transcripts reveal much about the reality of life on the Witness Protection Programme. Thursday the 22nd of May 1997, 13 weeks before the trial. I'm getting really paranoid, I just can't help it. Some days are better than others. Sometimes I have a drink and it makes me more relaxed. Other times I have a drink it just brings my paranoia out even more. I lay in bed. I just can't sleep because all I can hear is these people in the street outside walking their dogs and stuff and I'm all convinced that it's them coming from me. Since I've been here in the safe house I've had constant sleepless nights. Sometimes there's a noise, just a small noise and it sets me off. If a cat meows outside, I'm up in an instant, looking out the window, wide awake, while I'm creeping downstairs to check out the house. 
I've even started sleeping with a knife under my pillow. Sometimes when I'm walking down the road, I see people looking at me and I'm convinced that they recognise me. I'm always on edge. I'm drinking a lot. I suppose everyone expects you to be an alcoholic by now. I don't think I'm going to disappoint them. It's causing a lot of problems because I'm very selfish, but I don't know I'm doing it. After a little while, I just sit there, going to my own little world of a red striped lager. But I need it. I'm not allowed sleeping tablets in case the defence end up using it against me in court. They might say that my testimony isn't valid because I'm under the influence of drugs. I don't feel like I'm a person anymore. I feel like a piece of evidence. Exhibit number one. I feel like I've been sealed up and I'm not allowed to get contaminated. It's weird. But the only time I feel like I'm really asleep is when my wife is awake. I suppose it's because then I can feel like she's watching over me, protecting me. But if she's asleep, I can't sleep. So it's back to drinking again. If I get pissed enough, I can always get to sleep. Wednesday, the 11th of June. Right now, I wouldn't recommend that anyone accepts witness protection. The police are just completely out of order. I've given them all the information they asked for, but they still refuse to say exactly what they're going to do for me. They say, wait and see, wait and see. That's no good for me. I'm really worried about things. I'm not allowed to work at the moment. It's just too much of a risk. So the police come around to visit me once a week and give me £48 because that's how much I'd get if I was on the dole. It doesn't go very far. But it's really stupid because the police gave Sandra a cover story which doesn't make any sense. Apparently, I'm this really successful builder who spends loads of time working on big money contracts abroad. I was fine while I was away, but now I'm back and I haven't got a pot to piss in. It must be really obvious that we live in a lie. If I could go back in time to when I was arrested, I'd never go down this route again. I wouldn't even consider it. I'd much rather be locked away with them and risk getting killed. In fact, I'd probably end up killing myself. I must have thought about it a hundred times in the last year. The way they've treated me, I'd just never do it again. I don't think anyone would. The way I see it, if you get put away for eight years, you do four. But when you come out, you can hold your head up high. You don't have to spend your life looking over your shoulder like I'm going to have to. I did it the first time, did the crime, and then did the time, and it was okay. I came out, and I was able to start my life again. But this time, it just never ends. It just goes on and on, and I always regret doing it. I'm looking forward to playing these tapes back when it's all over, because I'm hoping I'm going to be wrong. I hope the police keep their promises and help me start my life over, but I don't feel very confident. When I was in the Supergrass unit, the one thing you hear from people there is don't trust the police, don't trust the police. I'm convinced that I'm going to be shot on from a great height. Tuesday, the 17th of June. I asked the police for some money to put extra locks on the doors and windows. They said they couldn't afford it. I was trying to tell them how worried about things I was, but they just didn't seem to understand. I started telling them that I was going to make my own arrangements. I told them that when I got my new identity, I was going to apply for a shotgun license so that I'd have some way of taking care of myself. They just looked at me. I tried to explain that the people who were going to come after me were hardly going to turn up with lumps of wood or knives. They were going to turn up armed to the teeth. If I didn't get a shotgun, then at least I wanted them to get me a bulletproof jacket. So then if it did come on top, at least I could throw it on and perhaps survive it. They said they couldn't afford it. They gave me a car for emergencies. But then they took it off me. They said I was abusing it, that I was doing too many miles, and I wasn't keeping it clean. Now the car's gone, and one of my bowel conditions is that I should have a vehicle as a means of getaway. It's really fucking stupid. So now if anyone comes to shoot me, I have to hope that the bus is going by. Saturday, the 28th of June. The police said I'd arrange a holiday so that my family could come and see me. I don't believe them. All the things they've told me so far have turned out to be lies. They really don't want to do anything for you because they're terrified that when you go to court, it will end up being used against them. That's all very well. I mean, I understand it. I really do. But it's no good to me right now, is it? It's not very promising at all. If I do ever get a holiday, it's not going to be much fun anyway. Some caravan in the middle of nowhere with 20 armed guards and me mum. They kept saying I have to wait until after the trial, and that's when they'll start helping me out. 
but they won't tell me what to expect. The contract I have with the police says they have to pop me back in the position I was before I became a witness. I'm never sure whether that means getting me a job and somewhere to live or putting me in a town that needs a good drug dealer. I might get a nice little sweeping job down at Ford's or a job digging holes for the council and then they'll say to me, go on, enjoy your new life. I've seen all the things the papers are writing about me. They make it seem like I've got a private jet and a million pounds in the bank. Even if the police had that kind of cash to throw away, I don't think I'd get it. At the end of the day, police and criminals are pretty much the same really, so even the cops hate the grass. I don't think they like me at all. Sometimes, in my heart, I wish I'd never become a witness. When I first got arrested, I'd met with my solicitor, and he said that if I hadn't said anything, he probably could have got me off. After all, I only bought the drugs because Jim wanted me to keep him with Mick and Jack. I was a registered police informant. If only I'd kept my big mouth shut, I'd still be living in Braintree, and none of this would be happening. Friday, the 11th of July. Sandra's gone out for the night, so I'm here on my own looking after the kids. I'll probably have to tell my children the whole story one day. I'm not looking forward to that. They want to get married or something one day, and the whole name change thing can cause big problems. I don't know how they feel about their dad when I tell them. I just have to wait and see. To an extent, they know already. My eldest boy is too young to know what's going on, but he knows it's not right. He asked me lots of awkward questions. He wouldn't know what a supergrass was, but I'm always telling him off for telling tales on people. And if I explain what I've done, that's exactly what I think I've been doing. My kids think that the reason we had to move out of our old house in the middle of the night was because of some old World War II bomb that had been discovered and was about to go off in our street. It was the only excuse the police had come up with straight away. The first night, they had to put them in a police training school. My eldest isn't stupid. He can read. He kept asking Sandra, Why are we in a police station, Mummy? The first time I went to prison, the kids were told that Daddy was being sent away because he'd been naughty and made the Queen angry. They were really upset by the whole thing. They caught their mum crying every night. Ever since then, my oldest has been really clingy. When I've had to go into custody, just for a few days at a time to make statements or something, he's acted in a really odd way. I've gone to say goodbye, and he said to me, You are coming back, aren't you? As if he just knows that something's not quite right. It really gets to you. When I was away, I got all these letters and pictures and things, saying, Daddy, we love you, and we think you're the best daddy in the world. And I'm there thinking, No, I'm not. I'm full of shit. I've got all these kids telling me I'm wonderful. And I just don't deserve it. Monday, the 4th of August. Let's talk about the old Bailey. They took me there last week for a look around. And I can tell you, it's not a very nice place. The trial is going to be held in court number two, which is very, very overpowering to say the least. When I was at the old stole committal, I was at least 35 feet from the dock, where worms and steel were. This time, I'm probably 10 foot at the most. They're going to be there in my face, and there's nowhere to hide from them. It's made me pretty scared, because it's such a small room for the number of people that are going to be in there. They made me walk the route that I have to take to court every morning. I was expecting at least some sort of dedicated facility for special witnesses, but I was wrong. I go into the bailey through the back doors, and then me and my armed escort walk through the cells. Then we went along the corridor, up a few flights of stairs, and finally ended up in a toilet outside the court. What's this? I said. That's where we'll be keeping you, said one of the coppers. And that was it. That's where I'm going to be every morning. It's where I eat my lunch, and it's where I'll be sent to every time there's a bit of legal argument. A fucking toilet. Mind you, with the amount of nerves I'm likely to have, it's probably the best place for me to be. Thursday, the 14th of August. I don't think me and Sandra are going to make it. She keeps saying she wants to go back to Essex to go back to living a normal life. Sometimes, I think it just might be the best thing for her. But when I start to think about my future without her, all I see is problems. Basically, we're living a lie at the moment. And we have to spend our lives remembering all the lies we've been telling so we don't get caught out. It would be so nice. It's just a relief to be able to tell someone. It would be brilliant if there was someone out there who could understand why, why I am the way that I am. 
I feel that I must come across really weird to quite a few people. But I don't know whether I'll ever feel comfortable enough to tell any of my new friends the truth. The paranoia is always there. What happens if I run into someone I knew in the old days and I'm with my kids? What do I do? Not let the children speak? It's an impossible situation. My biggest worry is what might happen if Sandra and I don't get back together. What happens if I start seeing someone and I fall in love? Do I set it down and say, by the way, I'm a supergrass and there's a quarter of a million on my head, but we'll be okay as long as we don't tell anyone. What happens if you don't tell her? What if you do tell a girl, then you split up? If she tells an ex-boyfriend and he tells someone, but if you don't tell her, then how would you feel if they burst in for me and she's there? Tuesday, the 19th of August. I don't want to do it. It's only a week or so away, but I really don't want to go through with it. I've been sitting here trying to work out what they might ask me. I don't know if they're going to try and trick me. That's what really does my head in. I guess I'm trying to work out all the answers in advance, but my barrister says, one thing you shouldn't do is try to work out what they'll ask you, because they'll always come up with something different and you'll be stuck. I'm trying not to do it, but I can't help it. It's not just a case of me going there and telling the truth. The whole case rests on me. Without me, there is no case. So they're going to try and do absolutely everything they can to destroy me because it's their only chance of getting off. Are they going to call me a liar? They're going to try and rip my character apart. Are they going to try and let me speak at all? I just have to wait and see. I'm not looking forward to going back into custody. I'll be back in the police station again. But this time no one will be allowed to see me. No visits at all. They are scared that if anyone sees me when the trial is on, the defence will say I'm being coached or I'm being given ideas. So I'm going to be spending a lot of time on my own. I'm not looking forward to it at all. All you can do is watch TV. I'm fully up to date with Neighbours, EastEnders, Coronation Street, the lot. But that doesn't make up for much. And it's not like I'm in some peaceful place where I can think. Because it's a police station. It's full of drunks who are up for a fight. Especially on Fridays and Saturday nights. They scream and kick the doors all night long. It's horrible. And I'm not looking forward to it one little bit. I'm not the same person I was when this all started. I used to laugh at people who cried at soppy films, but now, at everything, even when I hear a song that's slightly sad, I tend to cry. I don't know why. I have thought about my dad a lot. That keeps going through my mind. I lay there, and as if he's there, but he's not. Difficult. They want me to see a psychiatrist to see if I'm cracking up. When they first said it, I felt good, because I thought they were actually worried about me. But now I realise they were just worried that I might not be able to give evidence in the case. Friday, the 29th of August, three days before the trial. Sandra isn't speaking to me anymore. Last night I told her I was popping out for a quick drink. I didn't get back till 3am and when I did, I was completely out of my tree. My neighbours are really on her side. They're all having a go at me today, saying, how could you go out drinking every night? when you're about to go off to Germany for two months. That's the story everyone's been given. Then I'm off abroad to work on some kind of building contract. They're all saying I should be spending more time with my wife. They have no idea just how much stress I'm under. If Sandra doesn't start talking to me again soon, I'm just going to go out back down the pub. As far as I'm concerned, any excuse to get pissed is a good one. Saturday, 30th of August. Back in custody. First night back in the cells. Not very good. I can't sleep. I'm very nervous. I'm bloody nervous. I've only been back 16 hours, but I've had my first big row with the wife already. We actually fell out of a difference of things that she said to one of our neighbours, something that I said to one of our neighbours. We forgot to confer. You tell so many lies in this game that it just happens automatically. You don't think. You don't ask. I just have to take it in my stride. People say don't worry, but I can't help it. This is the beginning of my whole life, and it's a life of worrying about everything. Don't need to be extra careful who I make friends with. I even have to make sure my kids don't slip up. At the end of the day, I can handle going to court and giving evidence. What I can't handle is the rest of my life. The rest of my life is going to be horrible no matter which way the verdict goes. I spoke to my mum a little while ago. That wasn't very good either. She just told me to tell the truth. Sunday, 
the 31st of August. I feel like shit. It's my second night back in custody and I've just had the biggest scare of my life. Sandra was really depressed when I left and scared about being on her own. When I phoned her back last night, she was feeling pretty miserable because of the row. But after a while, things seemed to be pretty much okay. But when I phoned her tonight, there was no answer. So I paged her. No answer. So I phoned her mobile. It was turned off. I started to panic. I didn't know what to do. So I told the police, and they started to panic. They sent a car around to the house, and she wasn't there either. And neither were the kids. So they started searching for her, and put an alert out on her car. And the whole time, I was just sitting there, feeling absolutely useless. I really wanted to do something to help, but I was locked up. I really started to believe they'd got to her. They knew the trial was about to start, and they'd snatched her away. I was ready to retract every statement I'd ever made. There was no way I was going to get in the witness box. I really believed my family had been abducted and killed. The police were getting really nervous, checking in my other relatives and with the families of the accused to make sure they knew where they were. Then at about 3am, the police said they'd found her. It had all got too much for her and she'd just gone off on some bender and left the kids with a friend. I know I'll keep going on about how tough things are for me, but I know it's fucking hard for Sandra as well. All this shit somehow affects the innocent more than the guilty. I was so relieved that she was safe. I wanted to tell her that I loved her and cared for her. But I just ended up shouting at her down the phone, calling her all the names under the sun. I was really having a go at her. It left her even more upset. Then I just sat on my bed and cried. Tuesday the 2nd of September. Everyone back in Braintree has got it in for me. If anyone gets arrested for anything, even if they get stopped by the police for speeding, the story is that I must have grasped them up. I'm getting the blame for absolutely every problem that everyone's ever had. I'm the ultimate scapegoat. Okay, so I'm an informer. I've informed on people. But I'm trying to make amends. I feel like more of a criminal now than ever before. I've been condemned to a life of misery. I want to sleep, but I can't. It's getting too close to comfort now. Someone told me today they want to use me in another trial next September. The one where Russell Tate and that lot are up for smuggling the drugs they find in Mick's mum's garage. I'm really fucked off about it. I was hoping that after the trial was over, that that would be it. They wouldn't have any more hold over me and I'd be able to get sentenced and then get on with my life. But now, they say I have to wait until the second trial is over. They've got me by the nuts. If I don't agree to give evidence, it's going to look really bad. The police won't petition the judge to give me a discount on my sentence. If I do give evidence, it means another whole year living in limbo. It's all down to me. Sometimes, I feel like a performing dog. The more tricks I do, the more dog biscuits I get. Friday, the 5th of September. I think I'm going to die of some stress-related illness before I get into court. There's another delay now, so I won't be in the box until next week. It's doing my head in. I got a letter from my sister today. She said she's really proud of me for doing what I'm doing. She's proud that I'm her brother. No one has ever said that to me before. Normally, my family are really angry at being related to me because of the things I've done in the past. It's nice to know. At least one person thinks I'm doing the right thing. Saturday, the 6th of September. I've been reading statements all day. Yesterday, the police told me to expect to be in the dock for at least a month. I'm bloody worried about it. I can't help it. What scares me most is the fact if there's one mistake, they could get off. Not because they didn't do it, because there is some stupid technicality. Why am I so scared? How can they be sitting in court smiling? I hear they're very confident. They think they've got a good case. But if they get off, it's a bloody travesty. People say you can't destroy the truth. But you don't get to be one of the top barristers in the country without knowing a thing or two. If they get off, I will be distressed. They won't get off. They did it. They are guilty men. If they get off, then I don't know what will happen. They will try to throw lots of doubt. I hope I can survive the onslaught of questions. I hope the truth is enough. What a situation to be in, eh? 
Monday the 8th of September. First day in court. I sat there all day in the toilet, but never got to go in. I was talking to the guys on the protection squad. They say, just tell the truth. Don't worry, take deep breaths. I must have heard that ten times. It got to be a real pain in the ass. I feel numb. Tuesday, the 9th of September. Today was my first day. I was really nervous this morning, nearly sick. I think part of it was the drive down from Essex to the Old Bailey in the back of the armoured Range Rover. It was like being in a boat in the middle of a storm. Then after that, I had to be in the court all day. I started giving my evidence. I just kept looking straight forward. I got brave at one point and had a quick glance to my side, but Mick and Jack were both engrossed in reading. They didn't notice me. It's all pretty good at the moment. I'm just standing there, telling my story. Thursday, the 11th of September. I started being cross-examined today. The bloke is very good. Very good. He made me think that I'm a liar. He made me think that they were innocent and that I made the whole thing up. He's making me look like a complete idiot out there and I'm not getting a chance to say why I did it or how the whole thing happened. He's bloody good. But that's why he earns the money he does. You don't hire rubbish if you're fighting for your life. I feel like a kebab. I'm being grilled in the courtroom and I'm just waiting for Steele's barrister to start slicing away. I could just imagine what the press are saying about it all. They're going to pick up on all the bad stuff because it makes a better story for them. I don't think the press like me at all. I don't think anyone likes the grass. I feel like the most unpopular man in the world. It's just like that joke. This bloke, who really hates Arabs, decides to join the French Foreign Legion so that he can kill as many of them as he wants. But when he goes to the interview... They ask him why he wants to join, and he says, I hate Arabs. I really fucking hate Arabs, and I want to kill loads of them. And they say to him, that's great, you're in. And then in his first day, he gets put on guard duty. In the middle of the night, another legionnaire comes up to him and says, look over there, there's four Arabs hiding behind that rock. So, quick as a flash, the bloke runs over and shoots the four Arabs, and comes back and shoots the legionnaire who told him where they were. Later on, his boss calls him over. Well done for killing the Arabs, but why did you shoot the other legionnaire? And the geezer says, Well, I hate Arabs. I really fucking hate Arabs. But I really hate people who grass even more.